from Matthew chapter 25. So if you want to open Matthew chapter 25, we can review a little bit today because there are lots of people who are present here who have not been present at the beginning of this study. So only fair thing we can do to introduce little bits from our first study to everybody so we can be on the same page. And chapter 25 of Matthew speaks about what? Let us look here. It says the parable about wise and foolish virgins. We often hear this parable. We often learn and study about this parable. But last time we took a different approach to this parable. The approach we took last time is to look at this parable a little bit in the light of Jewish traditions. Because we often try to read Bible and understand Bible based on our Western cultures on the cultures that we grew up with, and just a perfect example that you probably uh, just heard from Brother John. We usually say in Western cultures what? Here comes the bride. But in the Jewish culture, the groom was the one who was coming to get the bride, as we so see in this parable, because the groom came to get the virgins. Yeah? So the tradition's a little bit different. And now we will look in a little bit on, on those traditions. I just want to make a little bit disclosure here uh, because uh, when we talk about this relationship between church and Christ, in no any sense I want to say today that the church is the bride of Christ because Bible clearly says that the bride of Christ is the New Jerusalem. But the spirit of prophecy says in the Bible, the sacred and enduring character of the relation that exists between Christ and his church is represented by union of marriage. The Lord has joined his people to himself by solemn covenant. He promised to be their God and they pleading themselves to be his and his alone. And in Hosea 2.19, we can read, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Ye, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. So I'm not preaching today about trying to change your doctrines or, or interpretation of symbolism of Bible. We just learned in the Sabbath school symbols are important. So the bride in the Bible is the new Jerusalem. But the church is represented by that relationship of Christ and church. Relationship of marriage, yeah? And we can speak about that even more, about faithfulness, unfaithfulness. Everything is represented. Church is with relationship with Christ. But now we will go to our uh, chapter 25. We'll recap a little bit from the last time. Um, you see, in Western cultures, first comes the proposal, yes? Sister Maria, what comes the first in the beginning of relationships? I will be picking up on some people who this is important and fresh in their memory, yeah, for, for on younger people. So proposal comes the first, yeah, in the Western culture. Do you know what was the first in the Jewish culture? In the Jewish culture, before proposal, there was a betrothal process. What is betrothal? Uh, that's uh, in the ceremony of Jewish nation. If the guy likes the girl, they would... Uh, uh, he would pour a glass of wine for her and she would either drink of that glass or not. And if she drank from that glass, it meant that she is going along with his ideas of future. If she didn't, then she refused him pretty much. But there was no formal proposal because formal proposal in Jewish culture happens during the wedding time. And then the betrothal, it would be pretty much as a contract between two families. It would be a sp special feast, special celebration, which would happen in the, uh, during the betrothal process. But they were not married 
together. They will just betrothed together. And remember from last time we used an example of people being betrothed in the Bible. Was the perfect example? Joseph and Mary. Remember, they were betrothed already together. They were making plans. They even traveled together to the city of uh, Bethlehem to be uh, registered there, yes? But they were not a couple because when he knew that she was pregnant, he wanted to let her go. And then the angel from heaven came and told Joseph, do not do such thing because the... And then we have Jesus, all the prophecy. But they were, they were not married. So that shows us that during the betrothal process, the couple get to know each other. They, the bra, uh, bra, uh, groom had a specific responsibility. It was responsibility of, of, establishment, of establishing a house, building a house or finishing up, uh, furnishing the house. The bride, she had responsibility of preparing things for inside the house, the linens, the clothes, the different things that... Um, it was pretty much a, a semi-binding semi contract in which stipulation of marriage are laid out. And couple uh, used that time to get to know each other. During the, that process could have been long or short depending on the couple. And only thing that could break that process was a prior a betrothal or marriage, if it came to light, if somebody was uh, in, in this betrothal and then there was something from before that would dissolve this or evidence, evidence of infidelity or um, also failure of bride and groom to meet the stipulations described in the contract. That would uh, be enough evidence to break that betrothal. So, and then, uh, then after that process, the wedding came. And the wedding came when the groom would go and pick up a bride and bring her into, they would have an, another feast in her house, and then he would bring her back to his house or their house that he built for them to be together. And the ceremony was done in the, her, and then they had the celebration or banquet, banquet which would last as long as a week or however they want it long to be lasting, the celebration of marriage. So this is the, in short, kind of the whole process of the marriage, how it was happening in Jewish nation. But what's interesting to us today, when we look at this chapter 25, as we looked last time, and recap things that we learn in this chapter, how they are they may be looking a little bit differently in different light for us uh, after we discover or learn for ourselves the meaning of all the rituals in the Jewish culture, yeah? So it says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be like, likened to ten virgins who, looked, uh, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. So. What time or period of life are we talking about here? In the verse 1 of chapter 25. When these virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Is that a marriage ceremony? Or are they just waiting for a marriage ceremony? And at this time they are betrothed to be married. So this, this whole chapter take, uh, take its place during the betrothal process. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, it says, in the day of those kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it all shall stand forever. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. So we are living in a time of building of the kingdom. Time when the groom went where? Jesus Christ, what is he doing now? When he left disciples, what did he tell them? I shall prepare. He's doing what is acceptable, you see, by the call. He's preparing a place for us to be with him for his bride to be with him. And the bride at that time should do what? Prepare 
herself. So the foolish and wise virgins, what are they doing in this parable? They are preparing. It's not me. The meaning of this first word doesn't mean that they already dressed in their wedding dress and waiting for the broom to come. They are preparing themselves actively in this period of uh, engagement, in our words, uh, being betrothed or betrothal process is in, in Jewish, yes? And now five of them wise and five of them were foolish. How uh, they were wise or foolish, do you remember? They had oil, some of them had oil, and some of them did not have oil. Yeah, it says they, some wise took oil, and, and, and the other ones, they didn't take an oil. What does oil represent in this parable? Two classes of watchers represent two classes of who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps, it is represented the word of God. The oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. So lamps in their hands, it's a Bible. We all take Bible with us, yes? And the oil represents what? The Holy Spirit that fills heart of every one of us and help us to fulfill things that we read from his word. Some of the spirit of prophecy we read, it says, if we do not participate in truth, we have not received the holy oil, which the two golden pipes empty out of themselves. It is the Holy Spirit in the heart which works by love and purifies the soul. By Holy Spirit, by oil, we get cleansed and purified. And we found uh, that at verse 5, the bridegroom was delayed. And that's what the situation happening in our world today. When Jesus cries that we all waiting for him to come and longing for him to come, and our grandparents would preach that he would come in their lifetime, he is what? Delaying. Not because him not being ready, but because of what? We are not ready. We are not prepared. We are, the Lord is slow. Second uh, Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is the time. And what happened with these virgins? At the time when he was delayed. At the time when everybody should come to repentance, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. It's a life of Christians. You see, our life. You see, that's uh, one more uh, evidence that that's not the wedding day. Because hard to imagine somebody falling asleep at the wedding day. But during the, this year or two, who knows how long it takes Two couples to get to know together, to understand each other, to love each other, or they what? They all became drowsy. They, you see, they became drowsy and they fall asleep. And Jesus, he warned us, yeah, and his disciples to watch and pray because you never know in which day it shall come, yeah? And also, Remember, in the Jewish tradition, we talked about there was involved, what? A cup of wine. How that portrays a, a, in our uh, relationship with Jesus Christ, how did we get got engaged to be a betrothed to Jesus Christ? As a bride. Do you remember when Jesus sent his disciples? We just studied in our lesson today about communion. So you see, at the time of the first communion, he took the glass, the wine, and he said what? Take it and drink it. You see, every time we participate in communion services, we declare that we are betrothed to Jesus Christ. We declare that we will be waiting for him and we will be preparing for that wedding that is to come. Isn't it beautiful how that illustrates our relationship with Jesus Christ? 
But we, as we were supposed to be preparing, and we promised him through baptism and our relationship with him will be special, we became drowsy, it says here, yeah? And what is the drowsiness? Luke 21, 34 to 36 says all about it, but we'll read just a couple words from these Bible verses to remind us. Suffering, drunkness, and cares of this life make us drowsy. We forget about our engagement with Jesus Christ. Yes? And then verse 6. Midnight cry was heard. Behold, the bride, bridegroom is come. Behold, here comes the broom. You see? It's different in the Bible. Usually we like to see the bride come down the aisle because it's a beautiful picture and nice, and every eye is looking at her. But there will be time, and I think there is a time for us to experience that. While bridegroom is coming, you know what? The whole universe is watching a bridegroom. The whole universe is watching you and me. You know, sometimes we think we can hide, and sometimes we feel like I can do things and nobody will see them. But the things we do during this betrothal process, some things can dissolve the marriage. Because when we come to conclusion, this is, you know, the foolish, it says, all of them arose, and the foolish said to wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And you see, it, it would be interesting. I was researching a little bit to see how their lamps were working at that time. And you know, today we think there is a special pipe that feeds the oil, and there is a spark, and there is the igniter, and it ignites the light. As we have modern technology today, you know at that time what they used? It was a, pretty much a vessel filled up with rugs that were soaked, soaked in oil. And those rugs were burning. And as long as you had enough oil and enough of rugs to dip in that oil and just to put in that lamp, that's how you kept the light going. You see, and that's, in, in itself there is lots of beautiful symbolism how we can get our filthy rugs and with Holy Spirit, those filthy rugs, they will become, those filthy rugs, they will become a light a burning light, a sweet innocence for salvation of soil, of souls. Amen? But if you don't have oil, which is what? Holy Spirit in your heart, remember as we read in the beginning, then you don't have, you will have your filthy rugs always with you, but you don't have nothing to dip them in, and uh, that, that way your light will go out. Because the filthy rugs by itself, they only produce one thing. What is Stink, yeah? Filthy rugs. They, for me, are they stinky, dirty, and they just produce a stink. That's why so many Christians, they stink. Our life stinks. And everybody doesn't want to talk to you. So if you want to become a true Christian on fire for God, you have to have oil. And then, of course, you will produce light that will be shining around, Yes? And the, end, the wise, the answer tell, no, 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 we cannot share. Nobody can save anybody. We cannot share our life work. Remember we talked about Song of Moses? To sing a Song of Moses, you have to go through experiences, and then you will be able to learn that song to be able to sing together with Redeemed. If you don't have your own experiences, you will be just lip syncing. Lip syncing doesn't work in the kingdom of God, Yes? For that, you will be thrown out. And we talked about, uh, uh, the, the, about the message, importance of the message, uh, about uh, emptying the holy oil out of himself into the world and in action to supply necessities of other souls. That's our callings. And uh, seven says, they trim their lamps. Had those who claimed to believe in truth acted their part as wise virgin, the message would ear this have been given to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. See, just because of us falling asleep, that's why Jesus, the bridegroom, is not yet here. And the first and second and third angel message are to be repeated. The call is to be given to the churches. 
Nobody can save them. Uh, other, only I can save myself through the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart, yes? The ten virgins all claim to be Christians, but five are true and five are false. All have a name, a call, a lamp, and all claim to be God's ser at God's service. All apparently watch for his appearing. All started apparently prepared, but five were when wanting. Five were found surprised, dismayed, without oil, outside the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. You see, that's enough evidence here to break the, the contract that was made. See, the Christ makes a contract with all of us, like we study in lesson today. He died for everyone and he paid for every sin. But there was a contract signed between sinners and Christ, between virgins and Christ. You know, surprise, dismayed, without oil outside. There is another parable that goes along with this, which is found in Matthew chapter 22. Do you remember that parable? Parable of wedding feast. It also confirms the idea that uh, this is happening not, uh, the, we're not the bride, yes? Because the bride cannot be thrown out. So uh, the, the feast that is actually described in uh, chapter 22, it's not the actual wedding feast, it's a betrothal feast. That many were invited, yeah? But not nobody came. And we can go into that lesson too. Because at the point when Jesus comes second time, nobody will be thrown back from heaven down to earth, yeah? At that point, at that feast, that's where we're going to talk a little bit more about now as we continue to the second part of this uh, coming of the groom or deliverance in our words. And we read about this in Revelation chapter 19. If you open with me your Bibles to chapter 19, verses 7 through 8, they describe following events. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. You see, this verse applies equally to Jerusalem, which is ready as a new Jerusalem to come down from heaven. And also it applies to the virgins or church or you in me. So bride, his wife, has met herself ready. There is enough to rejoice in that, yes? Because we're still waiting for that time, but it's not uh, coming until we are purified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous, righteous acts of the saints. You see, it talks about the right linen. As in parable uh, in Matthew chapter 22, it talks about also that was Closing, special closing was given to all attendants of the attending, attendees of the uh, wedding feast, yeah? Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true saying of God. And I fell on his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see, uh, somebody asked me to, are you going to continue your study about the marriage of the uh, bride and groom that you studied? I'm like, I wish to, but we don't have the enough biblical evidence uh, to show that the church is going to be a bride and married to Christ. And people were sad. Those who asked me and said, how come? It's sad. It's an unfinished story. But I told them, look, it's a new Jerusalem who is the bride of Christ. And we are not the bride of Christ because we are, who are we? In Christ, who we become? It's a good test for our memories. 
We are brothers. We are children of God. You see, there is, a, there is nothing, nothing wrong to be a bride, yeah? But you have to go through a process to become a family, yeah? It may happen or may not happen. But for us, it's already fulfilled fact. We don't have to guess yes or no. We already adopted into the family of God. And we are already partakers of that life if we follow all the stipulations that are written in the Bible. And we are invited to the wedding feast. Yes, we're not going to be a bride. We are, will be participants in that. We're not a bride, but we are participants in the wedding feast of Jesus Christ with Jerusalem. And to be at that feast, there is also important preparations that needs to be done. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Let us look uh, at this Bible verse. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So you see, our privilege is great. We are joined with the God to be one in the spirit, to be one with him. Let's look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 19, and we'll talk about a little bit about bridegroom here. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So who is the bridegroom? Who was he talking about here? Jesus himself. He is the bridegroom. Who is the bride? Let's again, as a good students of Bible, open 20, Revelation 21 and verse 2. It says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And who is the bride? New Jerusalem coming down from heaven prepared as a bride. In verses 9 and 10, they continue. They say, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came unto me and talked with me, saying, come, and I will show you the bride of the lamb of uh, bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in his spirit to the a great and high mountain and showed me the great holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. And let these verses not be said for you that the, many, as many think that the church is not the bride. In symbols we are. Symbolically we are as a bride for Christ. And you know what is even better? When that new Jerusalem city that Brother John preached to us and showed us wonderful pictures and told us about wonderful dimensions and beauty of that city, when that city will be coming down, it will not be empty. For that we shall praise the Lord. It will not be empty. That's a good news. I don't see rejoicement. But if that city was a bride and it was empty, and it was marriage between Lamb and Jerusalem, that would be hopeless for me. But that city will be full of whom? Of redeemed. That city, in wonderful dimensions, will be full. So in a sense, it's not only marriage just with the city, but it's also a marriage with whom? With the inhabitants of the city. Amen? Let's praise the Lord for that. The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats, in the forest and the mountains, still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of armed, man, armed men, urged on by hosts of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. 
See, this is the conditions that will persist in this world right at the moment when the groom is ready to come. Our study today is what? Here comes the groom. You see? But I want to, I want to show you a little bit where we're going to be in relationship to that day and what's going to be. You see, the bride is preparing. Ten virgins, as we're talking about us here, and the groom is coming, but when they're preparing, what are they? Some in the prisons, some hidden in solitary retreats, forests, and mountains. That shows me that these people were not only foolish virgins, they were wise virgins because they had their filthy rug soaked in Holy Spirit, in oil, that changed their life to the such a condition that they could not continue to be in places where they used to be. They could not continue to work where they used to work. They could not continue to live where they used to live because the Satan went into the war with these people. Not because they were nasty, not because they were filthy Christians or bad Christians. Those Christians will not be persecuted. True Christians will be persecuted because the world could, cannot stand their what? Righteousness and then following Jesus Christ. They were in terrible conditions. You can read lots of this uh, in uh, Great Controversy and other Spirit of Prophecy books. People of God, but by the people of God, a voice clear as a melodious is heard saying, look up and the lifting their eyes to heaven, they behold a bow of promise. In those dark conditions, so dark condition of this world, the people are exhausted, persecuted, terrified, and the voice, suddenly the voice, the voice that will, uh, in other places of spirit of prophecy says, will penetrate every bone. You see, we, we often think that we can hear only through our ears. Sometimes you can feel and hear things through every member of your body. Did you experience that? So that will be the experience. Everything on this earth will hear this voice. That voice will be heard everywhere. And that voice will tell to the believers, look up. Remember this. As you go through the darkest time of your life in this life, he is always telling you, look up. Every time you look up, you'll find a hope. Every time you look down, you'll find more discouragement and stress, and it will pull you even more down. Hope. John 17, 24 say, they come, they come, holy, harmless, and undefiled. They have kept the word of my patience. They shall, they shall walk among the angels. And in that midnight, it is a midnight that God manifests his power for deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength. Have you ever thought about idea of sun appearing in the middle of the night? I experienced in my life darkness in the middle of the day. Remember when everybody drove to Cheyenne? Not to visit Schaefer's, of course, but they wanted to see a sun being blocked by the moon. Yeah? And it was impressive. The birds stopped singing. The little trickets, yeah, they went out and they started making noises. Everything was feeling like a night and darkness is coming. But that's nothing compared to sun appearing in the middle of the night. If you think about it, it's nothing to compare because the sun is being blocked, but you still can see it. And sun appearing in the middle of the night. And not only sun, signs and wonders follow us in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amusement upon the scenes, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heaven is one clear space of undescribable glory. Whereas comes the voice of God 
like the sound of many waters saying, it is done. Here comes the bridegroom. It is done. It is finished. Remember he said on the cross when he paid for our sins. When he says it is done, the time for accepting his sacrifice is over. It is done for everybody, whoever, whatever was done in life is complete. Soon, there appears in the east a small black cloud about the half of the size of man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounds Savior and which seems to be in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God, they do know this to be the sign of Son of Man. In solemn silence, they glaze upon as it draws nearer to earth, becoming lighter and more glorious. Jesus rise forth as a mighty conqueror, not now a man of sorrows to drink a bitter cup of shame and woe. He comes a victor in heaven and earth to judge the living and dead, faithful and true. And on each side, Revelation 19.16 says, And he had on his vesture and on his tithe a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Those who believe in him will be invited to join him on the cloud. All the hopes of people for all the generations. Believers were dying. Believers were being burned. Believers being sacrificed to death with only one hope. To see the glory of coming of Jesus Christ. They will get to see that. Because his voice will resurrect. And those who are alive will be changed in a moment. And everybody will join him on the cloud. On each side of the cloud, chariots are wings. And beneath are living wheels. And the chariot rolls upward to the holy city. And the wheels cry holy. And the wings, they move, cry holy. And the angels cry holy, 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 Lord Almighty. And the redeems, redeemed, shout, hallelujah, as the chariot moves onwards towards the new Jerusalem. Before the entering new Jerusalem, God the Savior bestows upon his followers the emblem of victory and invests them with the insignia of their royal state. See, we're not only there by chance, but at this point we become adopted. And we get our insignia, our royal statehood, so to say. The glittering rings are drawn up in the form of the hollow square about their king, whose form rises in majesty high above saints and angels, whose countenance beams upon them full of benignant love. Upon the heads of the overcomer, Jesus, with his own right hand, places the crown of glory. For each there is a crown, bearing his own new name, and the inscription, Holiness to the Lord. In every hand are placed a victor's palm and shining harp. Then, commanding angel strikes the note. Every hand sweeps the harp strings with a skillful touch, awakening sweet music in rich melodious streams. Rapture, unutterable, trills every heart, and each voice is raised in grateful praise unto him that loved us and washed us from all sins in his own blood, and he had made us kings and priests into God unto his Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. 
And then Jesus, Holy Inspiration says, opens the pearly gates. And all the nations that have kept the truth enter in. There they behold the paradise of God, the home of Adam in his innocency. Then the voice richer than any music that ever fell on mortal ear is her saying, Your conflict is ended. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The music that no ear have seen. I think Brother John shared with us wonderful music from the general conference where we had many, many participants. But that will be nothing and pale in comparison to what redeemed will experience as a final events of the history of this earth will be disclosed. Your conflict is ended. Do you wish to hear these words? Do you wish to be among those people? Is the price is too high to pay? Revelation 14 and verses 1 through, four, through 5. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on a Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sung as it were were a new song before the throne, before the four living, four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they, were, they are virgins. This is brings together our parable that we started with in Matthew chapter 25 about virgins. And brings us all the way around on the, in heaven, on the sea of glass, 144,000. These are the ones who are virgins because they're not defiled with the woman. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from the among the man, being first fruit to God and to the lamb. And in their mouths was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And Holy Inspiration described this wonderful ceremony because we all wanted to see how the wedding feast will be, yes? Upon the crystal sea before the throne, that sea of glass as were mingled with fire, so resplendent it with glory of God, are gathered the company that have gotten the victory over the beast and over the image and over his mark and over the number of his name. With the lamb, lamb upon Mount Zion, having the harps of God, they stand, the 144,000 that were redeemed from among the men, and there is heard as the sound of many waters and as the sound of one great thunder, the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sing a new song. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness through the realms of illimitable space. From the minute atom to the greatest world, all things animate and, anim animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 8. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard, I say, and saw, I fell down to the worship before his feet of the angel 
who showed me. See, the, we're just looking for the glimpses of things to come. But when John saw all of these things, what was his reaction? To bow down and worship him. An angel did stop him, but what is our reaction when we study and learn about God and his plans for us? What should be our reaction? To bow down to him and pray. You see, one more Jewish ceremony that happens that I wanted to mention during the ceremony of wedding. They take a glass, wrap in a, in a, in a foil or, or some material, and they break that glass. You see, and uh, there are many different interpretations to that as destruction of Jerusalem and other things in Jewish culture. But when I think about how that glass is destroyed, remember in the beginning we read Daniel, and what was that? In those days, God shall build a kingdom, and what happens with all the rest of the kingdoms? They shall be destroyed. You see, that symbol, when the glass is broken, that was the glass that drank the wine when they were engaged together, when they uh, betrothed to each other. And by breaking that glass during the ceremony, for me it symbolizes that I will not be betrothed to anybody else in this life or life there forever. Because that glass is destroyed. There is nothing to drink of wine. There is nothing to be betrothed by. So may we in our life, when we come to Christ, when we realize what beauty he has prepared for us, what a future is awaiting for us, and what a celebration. You see, we're not talking about wedding feast here because the wedding feast will be eternal. The ceremony is over, everything is done, and there starts what? Celebration, and celebration goes forever because new heaven and earth. And if you want to be there, may our decisions and may our choices to be to cover our filthy rugs with his blood, accept the Holy Spirit in our life so our lives can be changed in his image. Amen.